Hello, and welcome to Precision Medicine in Hematologic Cancers, Lessons for Diagnostic and Treatment Protocols in CD30 and CD123 Expressing Disease. I'm Dr. Stephen Horwitz from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and I'm pleased to welcome my colleague from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. Ahmed Dogan, Chief of Hematopathology, and our colleagues from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Drs. Uh, Joseph D. Khoury in Pathology, and Dr. Naveen Pamaraju from, uh, I believe, the Leukemia Service. Uh, joining us today, and we're really looking forward to their presentation. So starting off with today's agenda, we'll look at clinical consult sessions, really interactive discussions between uh, uh, hematologists, oncologists, and pathologists, looking at the management of CD30 expressing lymphomas, and then the management of CD123 expressing cancers, uh, and advances in the diagnosis and treatment in that area. So we'll start off with lessons from clinical experience in CD30 expressing NHL, from Hodgkin to T-cell lymphoma. Ahmed? Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'll start with uh, describing CD30 expression in, a, uh, in lymphoid cancers. Uh, first, uh, antibody recognizing CD30 was developed against a classical Hodgkin lymphoma cell line by Harold Stein uh, in Kiel. The antibody was called Key one uh, to uh, indicate that it was produced in Kiel University. The antibody recognized uh, the, a protein uh, that is uh, coded by gene TNF-RSF8, uh, and this uh, gene uh, is part of the TNF receptor family. The CD30 is expressed by normal activated B cells and T cells in a subset of uh, lymphomas and myeloid neoplasms, and also rare epithelial cancers. C30 provides a number of growth signal for normal lymphocytes and lymphoma cells and is thought to be important in lympho lymphoma genesis of certain uh, T cell lymphomas. Within lymphomas, uh, by definition, classical Hodgkin lymphoma and ALCL show expression of CD30 uniformly in all cells. A subset of diffuse large B cell lymphomas, cutaneous T cell lymphomas, and other peripheral T cell lymphomas show variable expression of CD30. In addition, uh, fo follicular lymphoma and PD post transplant lymphopoietic disorder may show variable expression of CD30. So, yeah, I'll start off just describing a case that we'll use as a jumping off point. So, this is a patient, Helen, who's a 52 year old woman who presented uh, with palpable uh, axillary lymphadenopathy biopsy of the right axillary lymph node, I think we'll, we'll show you in, in a moment. Bone marrow biopsy done for staging was negative. She had an elevated LDH, and her IPI, or International Prognostic Index, was 2 for stage 3 disease, as well as elevated LDH. She's otherwise healthy and has a normal uh, ejection fraction. Uh, the biopsy was performed. This was an excisional biopsy and showed uh, an infiltrate of large anaplastic cells in a background of small lymphocytes and, uh, in this case, neutrophils, which is highlighted on the left panel. Uh, these uh, cells uh, strongly express CD30, which is indicated on the right panel. In addition, MUM1, a cytotoxic granule marker perforin, CD43, CD25, and focally PDL1, but lacked expression of other T cell markers, CD2, CD3, CD4, CD5, as well as a numerous B cell markers, CD22, CD79A, PAX5, etc. Uh, genetic studies was performed, uh, and uh, this showed that the tumor cells were negative for uh, uh, ALK translocation, thus 22 translocation or TP63 translocation. Oh, I was going to say, let me stop there for a second. Just ask, so this is a 50-year-old with adenopathy, and it looks like the immunohistochemical, immunohistochemical workup was very broad. So what information do you need or like from the clinician in terms of guiding this workup, or would every lymph node get this extensive of a panel? Uh, no, this, this was a special case. Really, uh, of course, the presence of uh, evidence of uh, you know, disseminated disease is an important criteria for reaching a systemic uh, anaplastic glass cell lymphoma, as you know, for example, cutaneous anaplastic glass cell lymphoma may involve localized lymph nodes, so therefore that kind of clinical correlation is critical. Um, 
The challenge with the CD30 positive uh, proliferation is the differential diagnosis between, uh, for example, CD30 expressing peripheral T cell lymphoma and uh, on, on one hand and the classical Hodgkin lymphoma on the other hand. Therefore, a wide panel is required to show that uh, there is a suppression of the T cell program uh, as shown by lack of expression of pan T cell markers, as well as absence of a B cell program uh, to rule out classical logical lymphoma. And then, uh, you know, typically we would look for ALK expression, and more and more these days we're asking for DUS22 or TP63. Can you just describe that a little bit in terms of uh, how easy that is to do and whether or not it should be routine in, in these cases? So DUS22 uh, and the TP63 translocations have been identified in a subset of uh, ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphomas. There is some evidence suggesting that DAS22 cases may have a more indolent course, whereas uh, TP63 uh, translocated cases appears to have a much more aggressive course. And for this reason, we try to provide that information in our pathology uh, workup of anaplastic large cell lymphoma to help guide uh, clinical decision making. One of the challenges, of course, these assays require specific uh, fish probes, which are not widely available and may be uh, only provided in a set certain academic centers and uh, by some of the uh, reference laboratories. Therefore, uh, additional effort will be required to be able to these tests to be completed. But would, as a clinician or a, or a pathologist, you'd be safe that until you make a diagnosis of ALK negative ALCL, you don't need to do those additional tests, or would they be done earlier before that diagnosis was confirmed? No, you have to have the diagnosis of ALCL because those genetic changes may see in other, other tumors by themselves. They are not are, are diagnostic. They are more important for uh, you know, prognostic implications rather than uh, primary diagnosis. So uh, if one reviews the NCCN uh, clinical practice guidelines, CD30 uh, testing is recommended for a range of lymphomas, uh, uh, for peripheral T-cell lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, and primary cutaneous CD30 positive lympho lymphoproliferative disorders. Uh, really, this is considered to be essential. And then CD30 testing may be useful under certain circumstances in mycosis fungoides, the LBCL, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, adult T cell lymphoma leukemia, and post transplant lymphoproductive disorders. So, the, the, to test the CD30, there are two common methodologies uh, available in clinical setting. Uh, one is using flow cytometry, uh, the other, other immunostate chemistry. Flow cytometry requires fresh viable cells isolated from lymph node tissues or blood, bone marrow, or body fluids. Again, uh, that has to be presented in a fresh solution format to be able to use. And immunostochemistry can be performed on sections of uh, formal lymphics, perfect embedded tissues, or frozen tissue sections. Flow cytometry uh, offers a number of uh, advantages, uh, including large applicability to a variety of specimens as long as they are fresh. Uh, the, there are uh, very good uh, systems to control the staining uh, and uh, the sensitivity of assay is really high, so therefore can detect weak expression by the tumor cells. Uh, because the flow cytometry combines uh, multiple antigens, one could identify the expression specifically on the tumor cells using uh, additional phenotypic, phenotypic uh, markers available in the panel. Uh, turnaround time is pretty quick. Within a couple of hours, one could get a readout. The dis disadvantage, of course, is that you need to have viable cells. Uh, uh, the tissue requirement may be uh, uh, difficult in certain specimens, and uh, uh, it is a more costly assay. In contrast, immunohistochemistry chemistry uh, provides uh, the phenotype in the context of morphology, which is, uh, which is not, of course, possible by flow cytometry. Uh, currently, there are excellent uh, methodological uh, developments that allows you standardized testing for CD30. One could appreciate not only membrane staining, but also cytoplasmic staining uh, using immunostochemistry. chemistry. It's possible uh, semi-quantitatively assess the expression. It is uh, relatively uh, cost-effective. 
the difficulty is that uh, the fixation is very important. Therefore, false positive and false negative re results may be seen in inappropriately fixed specimen. The assessment of the C30 expression, uh, the, the quantitation is often uh, subjectively done by the pathologist and may not be very reproducible. And the assay may take a couple of days to perform, therefore uh, has a longer turnaround time. Here's an example of CD30 expression in anaplastic large cell lymphoma we saw recently. Uh, the dark, uh, the uh, turquoise uh, color here reflects the tumor cells that lack CD3 expression but show expression of CD2, uh, CD45, in this case unusually CD56, as well as CD30. The red and green populations show the normal T cells which show bright CD3 expression, for example, but lack CD30 expression. So if I could jump in again there for Ahmed or maybe Joe uh, as well, this is a flow, a flow assay. As the clinician, we have to ask for this ahead of time or because it's live cells let you know that we're worried about a CD30 positive process or are there other clues or communication where this would be run routinely on a, on a lymph node aspirator, for instance? Yeah, so in, I think this is again a, quite a specialized assay and may not be available routinely in panels used by reference laboratories and smaller hospitals. In academic centers, uh, CD30 is often included in the T-cell panels. So you have to be aware whether this is in the panel of your laboratory uh, to be able to uh, get that result. Uh, it could be added if you specifically required, uh, requ you know, if you are suspecting ILCLs, it could be added to the panel. Uh, but in memory stone catering, we use this part of the panel. Uh, Joe, could you comment on how you deal with it in uh, MD Anderson? Sure, Ahmed. Thank you, Steve. This is a great question, too. So uh, at MD Anderson, CD30 is part of our lymphoma panel. And so we do look at it standard. Uh, it's... Uh, it's evaluated um, any time that we're looking at a lymphoid or at a specimen that's suspected of being involved by a lymphoid malignancy. But I would just like to go back to something that Ahmed mentioned earlier, a great point, and that is CT30 is, we, we have a long history of using CT30 in pathology by immunohistochemistry. And so um, it, it certainly, if you think about the lymphomas that express CD 30 with Hodgkin being um, one of the prototype examples, you're looking at rare cells in a background that's dominated by other inflam by inflammatory cells. And so CD30 in many contexts is really much more uh, easy to interpret looking at, at it in a tissue context than looking at it by flow cytometry. By flow, we often detect some CD30 positive events, uh, a, a finding that could be nonspecific unless one knows exactly what they're looking uh, at in terms of a pathology diagnosis. Joe, excellent point. I think really you, you need abundant tumor cells to be able to assess CD30 expression as we are seeing in this panel. So to follow on your, your point, here's an example of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, on the left panel, you are seeing the h &E section with three Sternberg cells in a background of inflammatory cells. And to the right, you can see the C30 expression uh, with some heterogeneity, uh, which is typical of Hodgkin's and is not as, you, as bright as you would see in anaplastic large cell lymphoma. In contrast, if you look at anaplastic large cell lymphoma, here is an example of uh, ARC negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma on the, on the left and then ARC positive on the right, they are really indistinguishable from the uh, uh, respect of uh, CD30 expression. The tumor cells are, in both cases, are very strongly and uniformly, there is no heterogeneity, uh, show expression of CD30. To the, in the right panel, you can appreciate CD30 expression, not only membranous, but also these sort of dark dots, which indicate Golgi staining. Again, a characteristic of uh, uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma CD30 expression pattern. Now, CD30 could also be expressed by other T cell lymphomas. Here's an example of uh, angiomeroblastic T cell lymphoma. On the left, you see the typical uh, H&E appearances of 
AITL with vascular proliferation and infiltrate of intermediate sized clear cells. These express a, a number of uh, uh, T folder helper markers, in this case, uh, PD1, strongly expressed. And you can see a smattering of CD30 positive cells. This is quite typical of uh, angiomyoblastic T cell lymphoma. It is often difficult to tell whether these cells are uh, really neoplastic uh, tumor cells or part of the microenvironment. Uh, in this case, my visual impression is that perhaps a subset of the tumor cells are expressing, but this could be very difficult to assess in angiomyoblastic T cell lymphoma and other peripheral T cell lymphomas. And a, another example of heterogeneous expression of uh, CD30 is seen in mycosis fungoides and scissor syndrome. Uh, in, in this uh, paper by Dovik et al, uh, they examined the CD30 expression by immunostochemistry in cutaneous biopsies and uh, categorized the expression based on in, uh, the number of tumor cells that are expressing CD30 to low, medium, and high. As you can see, uh, approximately a third of the cases were categorized as uh, low expressors, uh, approximately half uh, medium and uh, a small proportion as high expressors. Uh, despite this, uh, when they looked at the uh, MSWOT score, which is a way of assessing response to uh, treatment for mycosis fungoides, there was no correlation between the responders and CD30 expression. This suggested that uh, the conventional immunostochemistry may not be the best way to assess CD30 expression as, as uh, uh, cases with very low expression of uh, CD30 were still responding to targeted therapy against uh, uh, CD30. To investigate this further, uh, same group uh, used uh, multispectral imaging to enhance uh, visualization of uh, immunostochemistry staining uh, in this way, they are able to deconvolute for counter stain from the reactivity and enhance uh, the sensitivity of CD30 staining uh, by uh, using virtual digital methods. And you can see uh, in the uh, bottom graph, uh, the, the visibility threshold for ISC showed expression of CD30 only in a small percentage of the cases, whereas uh, uh, multispectral imaging was able to expression detect expression in a, in a larger uh, proportion of the cases, although at uh, much lower levels. Uh, CD30 is also expressed by other T cell lymphoma, uh, other lymphoid neoplasms, uh, and the most important of these of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Up to twenty percent of the diffuse large B cell lymphomas uh, have been shown to express CD30 at variable levels. Uh, most cases show uh, focal expression, as shown in this middle panel, about you know 20% of the cells being positive, and a, and a small subset of the cases show a much stronger C30 expression, uh, perhaps similar to the levels we see in classical Hodgkin lymphoma and rarely to anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So take-home messages uh, for uh, treatment decisions using CD30 is that CD30 has to be assessed routinely in classical Hodgkin lymphoma, anaplastic glass cell lymphoma, peripheral T cell lymphoma, and cutaneous T cell lymphoma, as uh, these patients uh, may be selected for targeted therapy to, to, for CD30. Uh, there is a suggestion by uh, uh, NCCN guidelines that uh, a subset of the diffuse large B cell lymphoma cases, uh, if they are expressing CD30, may be considered for uh, CD30 targeted therapy. Uh, the most important uh, message for pathologists is to indicate the exact percentage of uh, positive cells, C30 positive cells, to guide clinical decisions. Uh, this would not only include the overall percentage, but also uh, tumor cell specific percentage where it's possible to assess uh, such uh, detail. Uh, so, Steve, I'll pass the uh, the uh, podium to you, if you like, uh, to follow up with our case. Thank you, Amit. That was great. Yeah, so we'll just pick up with our, our patient, Helen, again, a 52-year-old woman with stage 3 alkanegative anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So she presents to us, we're thinking about what are the potential treatment options uh, with her, uh, and then sort of what's the role in the pathology uh, treating clinical team collaboration. I think you heard a lot about that uh, from Amit, about communication being important, uh, 
uh, conveying the importance of what we're seeing to allow them to do the best, most appropriate workup. And you saw here it was a very broad pathology workup to arrive at this diagnosis. So when we think about treatment options for frontline peripheral T-cell lymphoma, and we would include anaplastic large cell lymphoma as an important subset of that, uh, for most patients, we think about curative therapy. So uh, therapy that would induce remission and hopefully make that remission permanent. Historically, that's been combination chemotherapy, uh, CHOP. There is some data that intensifying uh, treatment uh, from CHOP by adding a topicide may be better uh, than CHOP alone. And the most compelling data probably is in those with anaplastic large cell lymphoma, probably in those without positive disease. But there is a sense that adding a topicide uh, to CHOP at least increases the CR rate, if not leading to uh, better long-term outcomes. A number of other regimens have been looked at, including dose adjusted EPAC, hyper CVAD, uh, other uh, fairly dose intensive regimens in small series where it's been hard to tell that those are truly better. But in some larger phase two studies, uh, we do have experience that uh, consolidating remissions with autotransplant may help increasing the chance of long term remission or cure. I think what's really changed our treatment for anaplastic large cell lymphoma specifically and to, to a slightly less extent other CD30 expressing T cell lymphomas, which I'll go into, has really been the sort of wide use and, and uh, data behind brentuximabidotin. So I'm sure as this audience knows, brentuximabidotin is an antibody drug conjugate targeting CD30. The CD30 is uh, conjugated to uh, MMAE or monomethyl or statin E, which is a microtubule disrupting agent upon binding um, the molecules endocytized uh, gets into the cell, and that's where it, it, it affects its uh, um, uh, uh, toxicity on the tumor cells. And brentuximabidotin was first uh, approved for a relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma and anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and there's been a couple of other additional important uh, uh, label extensions for T-cell lymphoma. So as we'll talk in a minute, uh, based on the uh, Echelon 2 study, which added brentuximab uh, upfront for untreated patients with peripheral T-cell lymphomas that express CD30. So this study uh, uh, um, was about 70% uh, patients with anaplastic large cell lymphoma. The rest patients had angiomunoblastic T-cell lymphoma or PTCL NOS expressing CD30. Uh, I'll show you that data, but that led to a label extension broadly for CD30 expressing uh, T-cell lymphomas in combination with chemotherapy. And then other data that I'll show you as well, uh, looking at primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma or CD30 expressing mycosis fungoides, again, a randomized study showing a benefit of brentuximab over standard therapy. Uh, and that also led to a label extension. So this is just the top line data from the Echelon 2 study. Um, uh, just to remind you, this was a, a large uh, um, multi-center double-blinded study giving brentuximabidotin plus CHP with placebo vincristine or CHOP chemotherapy with placebo brentuximabidotin. The study was powered to look at improvement in progression-free uh, survival. Um, and uh, again, about 70% of the patients had anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So that subset was powered uh, to be looked at independently. Uh, we just saw at ASH the five-year update uh, from the initial results, which showed uh, statistical improvement in PFS, more than a doubling of PFS, and that translated into an overall survival benefit. And that data has largely held up. So with longer follow-up, uh, there remains a statistical improvement in progression-free survival and remains statistical improvement in overall survival, with both the BVCHP and the CHOP arms actually doing uh, quite well in the study, but still statistically uh, better for BVCHP. And when you look at the systemic anaplastic large cell lymphoma subset uh, alone, and this applies to our patient with ALK-negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma, about 50% of patients on the study had ALK-negative ALCL. Again, here you see a uh, pretty clear benefit in PFS for patients with anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Once you get into the forest plots looking at subset analysis, um, I think the interpretations are sometimes a little less clear. So if I just focus your attention uh, based on the uh, the uh, 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 disease uh, subtypes, you'll see a pretty clear advantage for ALK positive and ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Once we get into the other subtypes like uh, angiomunoblastic T cell lymphoma or peripheral T cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified, these are smaller subsets. Uh, they weren't necessarily balanced between the arms, and you see very wide confidence intervals there. So while they're part of the intent to treat analysis, showing an overall PFS and OS benefit, when we look at those smaller subsets uh, on their own, it, it's a little hard to be definitive that adding brentuximab helps. Nonetheless, it's part of the label and something that we look at doing routinely. 
I should mention that when we added brintuximab and dotin to CHP, there was not increased toxicity when compared to CHOP. And I think that takes away some of the um, uh, concerns about adding additional agents to that regimen because we didn't really see a significant increase in toxicity. That was a big advance. I would say outside of uh, targeting CD30, there's a lot of other ideas being looked at in uh, uh, T-cell lymphoma, primarily small studies, primarily in the relapsed refractory setting. And just to point out here uh, at this ASH meeting, there's a number of, uh, of uh, new drugs uh, and new targets uh, being looked at. Uh, I think one can kind of roughly group them into small molecules targeting signaling pathways, including PI3 kinase, uh, including uh, ITK, uh, as well as the JAK-STAT pathway. And then there's a number of immunotherapy strategies, uh, both checkpoint inhibitors, uh, either PD-1 strategies or CD47 uh, strategies, as well as some other surface targets like uh, ICOS. And I would just point your attention to these uh, uh, to look at uh, uh, when you're reviewing uh, abstracts from this meeting. I think jumping over to cutaneous uh, T-cell lymphoma, this is again just the top-line data from the Alcanza study. So this was a study randomizing patients with CD30 expressing cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Uh, CD30 was defined as having 10% expression on the tumor cells uh, or higher, and patients were randomized to single-agent brentuximab and at a standard dose of 1.8 milligrams per square uh, sorry, milligrams per kilogram, uh, or physician's choice. And in this case, the physician's choice was bexerotene, a retinoid, or uh, methotrexate. And what you can see here is that there was a, a significant improvement in, uh, in both response, progression-free survival, and something called ORR4, which was a response lasting at least four months, all favoring the brentuximab vidotin arm. One of the things that we think about a lot or get asked about a lot is, is there a, a level of threshold or a lower limit of CD30 expression to correlate with response in T-cell lymphomas? So in something like anaplastic large cell lymphoma, where essentially all the tumor cells express CD30, it's not really a relevant question. But when we get into some of these other subtypes, uh, as Ahmed showed you with uh, mycosis fungoides or angioinoblastic T-cell lymphoma, uh, there has been some looks uh, uh, as to whether there was a lower limit uh, of expression that correlated with response. And I think the short answer is so far we don't have one. In the Alcanza study, um, which was, uh, again, uh, for patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, patients had to have 10% uh, CD30 expression uh, based on local review. And when we looked at, uh, at those biopsies, there was a fair amount of heterogeneity uh, and different ways of looking at CD30. But uh, kind of the bottom line there is if you look at the curves in green, um, whether they had low CD30 or relatively higher CD30, those groups look like they do the same, and they do clearly better than the physician's choice, again, whether there was relatively low or relatively high CD30. As part of analysis uh, that we worked on with, with uh, Young Kim and her team at Stanford, uh, who really uh, led this, uh, this is a, a phase two study of brentuximab and again in uh, mycosis fungoides. And in this study, all patients had at least two biopsies and multiple cuts uh, were done, uh, and CD30 uh, was looked at as the median CD30 max. And at least in that very detailed analysis of a phase two study, if your max CD30 was less than 5%, so this is looking at at least two biopsies, it looked like those patients responded less frequently uh, compared to those that had higher CD30. So there was no level, including those with essentially zero CD30, where there was no response. But it looks like there may be a lower, a lower level um, where uh, patients with very, very low CD30 uh, may respond less frequently. Uh, switching over to Hodgkin lymphoma, this is uh, uh, just a figure uh, showing the uh, FDA approvals of brentuximab vidotin uh, targeting CD30 again in Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, so uh, it's approved in combination with AVD, and I'll show you that data uh, in a moment, uh, for advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. It was initially approved as a single agent for uh, relapsed uh, Hodgkin lymphoma uh, or progression after autotransplant. Uh, and then uh, the Athera study, uh, which uh, gave brentuximab vidotin sort of as a post-consolidation after autotransplant or maintenance uh, for those patients who went into transplant with high-risk disease. More recently, we've had checkpoint inhibitors, both nivolumab and pembrolizumab, approved for Hodgkin lymphoma. So it's a disease with an already favorable prognosis where more potentially non-chemotherapeutic options are being incorporated into routine practice. And this is the uh, data from the Echelon 1 study. So Echelon 1 randomized patients to brentuximab vidotin plus AVD, AVD versus ABVD. Uh, 
and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And there was a statistically uh, a significant benefit in PFS uh, for adding brentuximab vidotin uh, to uh, a, a AVD. Uh, we just saw this update, uh, the five-year update from Echelon uh, uh, 1 uh, uh, at uh, ASH. And I think if you look, uh, you can see here in, in, in this forest plot that uh, pretty much uh, almost all the endpoints really uh, uh, lean towards uh, the left or favoring brentuximab, vidotin plus uh, uh, AVD. I think if you look in terms of the higher risk patients, that's where many have looked at this as potentially uh, uh, providing the uh, biggest bang for the buck or the most benefit. And I think it's one of the areas where there's very frequent use. I point out that there was some increased toxicity when adding brentuximab to AVD, particularly in terms of neutropenia or hematologic toxicities. So it is a case where when giving brentuximab uh, with AVD, uh, growth factor use is, uh, is uh, recommended uh, to be done routinely. And where this will all settle out, I think in Hodgkin lymphoma, there's a number of ways uh, to cure patients, both adding uh, BV to AVD. Uh, there's some risk adapted uh, strategies for those patients with early PET negativity, dropping the bleomycin uh, from ABVD to reduce toxicity. And then of course, historically dose intensified regimens with es such as escalated BACOP uh, may uh, be more potent. I think uh, the uh, uh, routine uh, uh, use of pembrolizumab or other checkpoint inhibitors in the relapse setting has kind of raised a lot of questions. So this was a, a study uh, from ASCO uh, just uh, looking uh, at a comparison of pembrolizumab versus brentuximab in relapse refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. Both drugs work quite well. Uh, uh, pembrolizumab provided uh, some longer benefit uh, in terms of PFS in this study. And I think that where this all settles out in terms of will BV be uh, uh, routinely incorporated in frontline as shown in, ech in Echelon 1. Uh, there's a number of uh, studies looking at possibly adding checkpoint inhibitors in combination with chemotherapy, either in the frontline or the relapse setting. Uh, so I think there's a, a lot of ways that these drugs could be mixed together uh, to give the best outcomes and hopefully the lowest toxicity uh, for our patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. So going back to our case, I'll just remind you, our 52-year-old with uh, ALK-negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma, she received six cycles of BVCHP based on the data from the Echelon 2 study, achieved a complete response. And the questions are, what are the next steps for management? Uh, well, I mentioned earlier that uh, there is some phase two data suggesting that autotransplant uh, may be beneficial in consolidation of first remission uh, for peripheral T-cell lymphomas. This was particularly true for those with anaplastic large cell lymphoma. And you see here that from the Echelon 2 study, where transplant was not part of the treatment but was allowed per investigator discretion, it looks like there may still be some additional incremental benefit. This is not statistically significant, so the data is a little bit in the eye of the beholder, but at least when we look at the curves numerically, those who receive transplant at first remission look like they may do a little better uh, than those who are observed at that point. Um, Moving away a little bit from uh, anaplastic uh, large cell lymphoma, uh, this is another case where we just changed the scenario a little bit. So a slightly older uh, patient, in this case a man with a new diagnosis of angiomenoblastic T-cell lymphoma, advanced stage disease, here IPI3 for age stage and LDH. Um, we saw some uh, uh, new data at ASH this year looking at some different upfront treatment strategies that may be particularly uh, interesting for those with angiomenoblastic or follicular helper T-cell lymphomas. Um, Amit, could you just comment a little bit on sort of the mutational landscape of this one particular subtype or these several subtypes of peripheral T-cell lymphoma? Yes, of course, uh, Steve. Uh, the, so angiomenoblastic T-cell lymphoma really shows four uh, uh, frequent mutations and many other uh, mutations that are affecting the T-cell receptor pathway uh, that are seen in only a small subset of the cases. Two of these mutations, TET2 and DNMT3A, uh, are thought to be related to an underlying clonal hematopoiesis that may have a that may have been the background for development of the angiomyoblastic T cell lymphoma by acquisition of additional uh, mutations such as ROA or in in some cases IDH2, uh, in others uh, other mutations affecting the PI3 kinase uh, uh, signaling pathway. Uh, leading to a uh, neoplastic process. So those uh, uh, actually uh, genetic features correlate very well with the uh, uh, T follicular helper phenotype of angiomenoblastic T cell lymphoma and are now used as almost uh, surrogates for uh, diagnosis of uh, this uh, category of tumors. Thank you.
Yeah, and I think what we've seen clinically is maybe not truly causation, but at least a correlation that some of the uh, these epigenetic modifiers may correlate with better response in angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma as opposed to other types of peripheral T-cell lymphoma. Uh, we've seen that both with HDEC inhibitors like romadepsin uh, and uh, small studies with uh, azacitidine, uh, both looking like they have differential activity, uh, again, more efficacy in AITL. And we just saw at the ASH meeting here uh, uh, two attempts at moving uh, uh, those treatments into the upfront setting. There was a large randomized study uh, presented from the LISA group uh, in France uh, uh, combining romadepsin uh, plus CHOP versus uh, placebo plus CHOP. And as you saw, overall, this was a negative study. Uh, treating all comers, it didn't meet its primary endpoint of a benefit in progression-free survival. Though there was this, uh, you know, if you look at the four spot, there was this interesting uh, um, uh, a subset with angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma that didn't meet statistical significance. But if it looked like if any group did better, it was possibly that group. So hopefully we'll get more uh, detail on that. And then another very interesting study, though very early, from uh, one of our colleagues at, at Cornell, Jia Ruan, uh, uh, where uh, they added CC486, so an oral form of azacitidine, uh, to CHOP uh, chemotherapy. And it looked like in that, uh, uh, again, small pilot study, that the patients with AITL uh, had higher rates of complete resp overall response and complete response, uh, as well as those with TET2 mutations uh, doing a little better. Uh, so it looks like that may be another strategy um, where we're uh, targeting uh, specific subtypes with sp specific vulnerabilities, a little uh, uh, more complicated than just targeting CD30 with brentuximab. But I think we've seen that that strategy of, of both uh, targeting uh, individual vulnerabilities on the tumor, enriching your population for those patients most likely to respond as a possible way forward in T-cell lymphoma. So uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Ahmet, uh, as well as uh, uh, Joe and Naveen for uh, contributing uh, to that session. And it looks like we're getting some questions from the audience. Um, so uh, maybe if we can take a few of these now. Um, I'll read the first one. Is there any correlation of intensity of CD30 expression with brentuximab benefit? Um, Again, I showed you um, some data we have as to uh, the um, percentage of tumor cell expression. Um, I don't think we know a lot in terms of uh, the intensity of expression um, outside of the tumor cell. I don't know, Ahmed or Joe, are you aware of any? Uh, no, this uh, because of the, I think, the uh, limitations of C30 testing, it's difficult to know whether uh, it's difficult to quantify actually intensity of C30 expression, especially using immunostochemistry. Um, therefore, it's difficult to comment whether how that could be quantified and uh, related to uh, benefit from uh, C30 targeted therapy. Yeah, I think mostly what we've seen is percentage of cells positive, but not, a, not an intensity score. Probably another question for our pathologist, um, do you retest CD30 uh, or other markers, this question asked, uh, for, uh, after relapse of PTCL? Yes, uh, we use standardized panel, which always includes CE30. We have seen cases uh, losing CE30 uh, after initial therapy uh, you know, at relapse, also uh, cases acquiring CE30 at relapse. So it's recommended that uh, CE30 is tested at, at relapse irrespective of the origin of phenotype. Joe, is that pattern practice similar at MD Anderson? Yeah, I was going to say, Steve, uh, totally agree. Uh, that's our standard procedure at MD Anderson as well. We evaluate CD30 at every uh, time point when there is lymphoma to be assessed. Yeah. Um, oh, and a COVID question. What a surprise. So maybe I'll ask Naveen. So has, has managing patients during COVID caused you to experience delays in diagnostic testing? initiating treatment for PTCL. So maybe we'll just expand that to hematologic malignancies in general and would love to hear um, uh, how you guys are managing this. Thanks, Steve, for uh, bringing up this important question about the management of our patients with leukemia and lymphoma during COVID. This is the important issue of our time and it'll extend into next year. I really think of it in, in three ways. One factor has been in the delay for sure in terms of diagnosis, particularly for our patients with the more rare and ultra rare subtypes. So that's a delay in referral from the community center to the academic, uh, the delay in terms of not having as much personnel, at least in the beginning parts of the pandemic, and then certainly 
not having access to uh, other ancillary services. So I think that's an important part. Number two is in terms of treatment options, for sure, a lot of us have been influenced in terms of age, comorbidities, length of stay in the hospital, travel and logistics. That really has played a role in terms of intensity of therapy. So sometimes, sometimes that's favored the choosing of uh, less intensive therapies or even targeted therapies over intensive therapies. And then finally, Steve, I think in terms of stem cell transplant, many of us are now up and running for sure, but particularly with regards to not only the virus itself, but again, in terms of logistics, timing of a stem cell transplant, maybe delaying, maybe not even having it there. And then the concern for reactivation over infections, again, not just COVID, but, but other opportunistic infections. Steve, I think another factor that I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on will be once vaccines come, uh, potentially, uh, you know, as of this taping, maybe even within a month or less, how will that impact our patients with leukemia and lymphoma in terms of receiving therapies? How will the COVID vaccine, you know, how, how will this, how will this uh, factor in, Steve? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think for aggressive diseases where we're treating with curative intent, kind of like, kind of like you said, our hands are a little bit tied in terms of waiting. You can't safely wait. But I think where we are seeing some of these decisions are maintenance therapies, ongoing therapies. For T-cell lymphoma, we've been spreading out doses of romadepsin or mogamolizumab. And for low-grade B-cell lymphomas, where delaying rituximab or avoiding rituximab maintenance, kind of stopping a lot of our patients on long-term rituximab in the fall to try to let their B-cells recover for what we hope will be a, a vaccine come spring. But um, it's it's, it's, it's a challenge to know what to do. I feel like now that maybe we have some timelines for a vaccine, that it's not this hypothetical wait, but it's a several month wait. Um, uh, it, it may be a little easier for decision making. And Steve, one other point, if I may, with COVID and our patients with heme malignancies, leukemia, lymphoma, another question, which has come really from our European colleagues as well, is the depth of illness that they can have with regards to severe uh, CRS, cytokine release storm. And, and we've, we've certainly seen patients uh, either close to death or even die in the setting of CRS. And I'd love to hear your comments that some of these chemotherapies and targeted agents may actually be used to treat uh, the cytokine storm, particularly JAK inhibitors and, and other classes. So it's just a kind of bizarre time where we have to think about those kind of uh, toxicities. Yeah, no, I think, I think the learning curve has been steep and trying to understand sort of what's helpful in what circumstances, what's harmful, has been a, a little tricky uh, uh, in evolution. Um, thank you, that was fantastic. Um, I think maybe we'll do one last question just for time and then we'll move on to the next section because I think this is important. What do you recommend for uh, a growth factor use for brentuximab avidotin regimens in Hodgkin lymphoma? And I think I'll broaden that to brentuximab avidotin in combination with chemotherapy. So the Echelon 1 in Hodgkin lymphoma, we saw improved efficacy, but greater toxicity in terms of heme toxicity, and growth factor use is, is really strongly recommended uh, there. Not usually needed for ABVD, but, uh, but needed for BVAVD. And then again, in the Echelon 2 study with BV, uh, CHP versus CHOP, we did not see higher uh, rates of toxicity with BV, CHP, but in that study, you, based on investigator, could or could not use primary prophylaxis with growth factors. And we saw significantly less uh, high-grade neutropenia and less febrile neutropenia when growth factors were used. So that is also an important component, and it's in the label that when combining brentuximab with chemotherapy, growth factors are routinely used for safety. Um, I think we'll wrap up there and then uh, with the first part, and then we'll move on to our second part. And I, I really uh, thank all the faculty for a fantastic discussion. So th thank you for that first session. And now we'll move on to the second part, understanding diagnostic and therapeutic implications of CD123 expression in hematologic malignancies. And this will be led by uh, Dr. Joseph Curry and Dr. Naveen Pemiraju. Uh, Joe? Steve, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. This is a fantastic panel, a great activity, and I'm particularly pleased to be um, covering this section on CD123 with my friend and colleague, Naveen Pamaraju. Naveen and I work very closely together in what, in my mind, is an exemplary um, cross-communication um, setting at MD Anderson between pathologists and, and oncologists, and I'm sure Steve, you and Ahmed can, can say the same, and, and hopefully everyone can say the same in their setting. So a few words about the biology of CD123. I think we've heard a lot about this molecule in the past few years. Biologically, CD123 is the alpha chain uh, 
of the interleukin-3 receptor. Uh, this um, uh, alpha chain uh, in the presence of ligand, which is interleukin-3, forms a heterodimer with a beta chain that is uh, common actually to the uh, interleukin-3 alpha chain receptor as well as GMCSF. And uh, upon ligand binding, uh, here of course focused on interleukin-3, these heterodimers cause activation of JAK2 and important downstream signaling pathways get upregulated through STAT, through the MAP kinase pathway, and PI3 kinase pathway as well. Uh, physiologically, this is a very tightly regulated signaling pathway, but of course in pathological conditions, particularly the ones we're going to be focusing on today, BPDCN and others, CD123 is abnormally upregulated. But um, although this, of course, is something that goes to the core of these diseases, these cancers, the good news is that uh, it provides a vulnerability that um, we have been over the years able to usurp to target these cancer cells. So as I mentioned, uh, CD123 is uh, expressed at a high level in different hematological cancers. This includes the, the entity that we're going to be focusing predominantly on today, blastic plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm, or BPDCN. But in addition to BPDCN, which uh, expresses CD123 at a very high level, we see expression in acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, hairy cell leukemia, systemic mastocytosis, and occasional upregulation in some other types of cancers. Naveen, I'm going to turn this over to you so you can uh, introduce us to our index patient and we can go from there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joe, for that really helpful background on BPDCN. So our patient, uh, Stacy, is a 66-year-old woman uh, who presents with constitutional symptoms, so the classic fatigue, fever, night sweats, weight loss. Importantly for this patient, she had no skin lesions uh, present on exam, and that's important because possibly 60, 80% or more of our patients with BPDCN will usually have skin or cutaneous lesions. Instead, she presented only with classical bone marrow and peripheral blood blasts. And so as you and I work together closely over the years, it reminds me that it still comes back down to the basics, Joe, that we need bone marrow, flow cytometry, morphology, immunohistochemistry, because at this point, I'm thinking that she's transformed to AML. And so not only do we need to confirm that she actually has BPDCN, we need to rule out that this is an AML, acute myeloid leukemia, or that she has transformed in that setting. And so I think the challenges here for you and me at the uh, clinical pathologic level are manifold. One is that we are taught and that you and I teach that usually skin involvement is present in BPDCN, and that's correct still. I, I would say 60 plus percent, maybe even higher, have skin involvement. It is still a male predominant disease. There are multiple reasons for that, uh, three to one or even five to one male predominant. But as we know, we're starting to see younger patients, uh, females, not just males, and presentation without the skin, and that's what I think her case highlights. Moreover, for, for the clinician, primary to specialist, BPDCN not only is rare and has had many name changes, uh, but actually it can mimic or be confused with other related uh, entities that are hematologic cancers that involve the skin. So that's AML with leukemia acutis. That could be a non-Hodgkin lymphoma, as we just heard from our colleagues, uh, including the skin, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, mycosis fungoides, could be uh, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, CMML, could be perineoplastic, sweet syndrome, on and on. And so I think the key here, Joe, as you always remind us, is if you're not thinking about it, you can't find it. So if you're thinking about BPDCN, you know, we try to tell people think CD123456, look for these markers, and in particular, the CD123 uh, in that triad. And, and so I'd like to turn it back to you, Joe, to kind of guide us as clinicians. What is it that you're looking at as a pathologist to help us nail down this uh, rare diagnosis? <laughs> 
Excellent. Thank you, Naveen. Great points. So this is an excerpt from the NCCN guidelines, uh, of course, guiding all of us on the importance of certain uh, variables to be accounted for any time one is evaluating a potential case of BPDCN. Of course, nothing replaces basic, uh, you know, history, laboratory work, uh, skin examination, and so on and so forth, including uh, uh, LP to rule out CNS disease, which is not uncommon in BPDCN, as you well know, Naveen. Um, certainly, the, the, the key here is to uh, ideally have a mechanism to share the highlights from these findings with the pathology team. That sometimes can be uh, a bit more tricky. We don't have that problem when we're working within one system, but, but kind of transferring or, or relaying such information can sometimes be a challenge. Um, from a diagnostic standpoint, we uh, have over the years uh, developed an understanding that BPDCN requires the expression of certain set of markers. CD123, I would say, is a prerequisite. Without CD123, I would never call BPDCN. But the others can be variable. They're most commonly there. This includes CD4, CD56, TCL1, CD2AP, and CD303 have been advocated as important markers of BPDCN. We'll touch on CD303 a little bit down the line. But certainly 123, 4, and 56 are very important markers, as is TCL1. We're going to introduce our audience to a newer marker that we feel can, to a large extent, uh, s basically replace uh, this larger panel because of its sensitivity and specificity. It is important to note, I think, at this point that AML can co-express CD123 along with CD4 and CD56 uh, on occasion. That is why we need additional markers. At MD Anderson, we over the years have used TCL1 predominantly. And so TCL1 is typically negative in AML. And so it provides the specificity that uh, is layered on top of evaluating 123, 4, and 56. Dr. Dogan uh, Ahmed uh, has, has eloquently gone over the importance of flow cytometry and IHC, hide, highlighting uh, pros and cons of both of these assays. None of the assays we have at our disposal are perfect. We try to make the best out of them. We try to use them in combination whenever needed. Flow, in a nutshell, as Ahmed mentioned, is a very uh, quick turnaround time tool that allows us to look at multiple markers on tumor cells uh, and look at them using uh, fluorescent signals, which allow us a deeper sensitivity level than immunohistochemistry, which relies on light microscopy and the human eye being able to detect signal under the light microscope. IHC is a very powerful tool as well because we can use it on archival tissue and tissue that's been several days old to several years old. Uh, but, uh, but, but those same uh, pluses can, can sometimes uh, inherently cause some uh, increase in turnaround time. This is um, basically what Stacy uh, has in her bone marrow Naveen. So uh, she has 87% neoplastic cells, which here we're calling them blasts. You can see from this uh, bone marrow aspirate, uh, it, it looks like a peripheral blood aspirate, but the bone marrow was so packed that we had a dry tap. So, so we're looking here actually at a portion of the bone marrow smear that was open enough to allow us to visualize the blasts. Uh, it's, uh, I'd like to point at this, uh, uh, using this photomicrograph, that it is practically impossible to tell BPDCN from AML on morphology alone. That's why immunophenotyping using flow plus or minus immunohistochemistry is critical. 
I included some flow cytometry plots from this patient. You can see in the top right corner uh, the expression of CD123 on the neoplastic cells highlighted with this orange color. You can see that these blasts fall into the regular AML blast gate being dim for CD45 and fairly low for site scatter. So one looks at this and it's really again impossible to tell AML from BPDCN were it not for CD123 in this context. But as we mentioned, in addition to CD123, pivoting over to the left side panels, you see that the CD123 positive events are also positive for CD4 and CD56. You also see that they express strongly and uniformly CD2. This marker is present in about 20% of BPDCN. It's becoming a fairly important marker for us as we look at plasma cytoid dendritic cells in the context of residual disease. Uh, and you can see though, um, uh, in addition, that in this particular case, as is the case in the majority of BPDCN in our experience, CD303 is actually down-regulated. So although CD303 is an important marker that is expressed in, uh, that's expressed normally in plasma cytoid dendritic cells, in BPDCN, in the neoplastic version of these cells, this marker is often down-regulated which is why it has not been as helpful for us uh, in terms of uh, residual disease evaluation, which again, I will be covering in a few slides down. This is an example of CD123 uh, coupled with TCF4 uh, using immunohistochemistry. So TCF4 is a transcription factor, a master regulator that plasma cytoid dendritic cells need to be plasma cytoid dendritic cells. Without TCF4, these cells lose the PDC program. And so over, uh, a few years ago, we had an idea to couple CD123 with TCF4 in an immunohistochemistry stain, and it's really proved to be a very reliable, very useful tool in looking at plasma cytoid dendritic cells in general, but certainly as a sensitive and specific marker for BPDCN. And we're going to see an example of how this stain looks in BPDCN in a, in, a, in a few minutes. Here, I'd like to show you in the left-hand panel, CD123 expression in normal tissue. This is a normal tonsil tissue. Noting in particular where the asterisks lie, expression of CD123 in, uh, on endothelial cells, in capillaries. And so as we think of capillary leak syndrome as a complication of CD123 therapy, which I know, Naveen, you will be covering, um, I think it's important to remind ourselves that CD123 normally is expressed on endothelial cells. And, and so we got to manage this side effect uh, capably, as I know you and the leukemia team do on a regular basis. Um, on the right-hand panel, you see TCF4 and CD123 uh, expression in a bone marrow, in a normal bone marrow sample, where you see the longer arrows, where cells are expressing the, the red signal as well as the brown signal, the intense brown signal. Those are plasma cytoid dendritic cells. The arrowhead is pointing to a cell that happens to be strongly positive for CD123, but is negative for TCF4. And ergo, uh, this cell is a um, hematopoietic stem cell in all likelihood uh, that is positive for CD123. The expression of CD123 in hematopoietic uh, uh, cells in the bone marrow can be further depicted in this diagram. This is from a review we published recently, so of course, I, you know, you're welcome to check out the details in that review. But here, the red events by flow cytometry show you where normally CD123 positive events reside if you're looking at bone marrow components using CD45 versus site scatter. Uh, 
you can see also that CD123 is expressed along a spectrum if you plot it against CD34. So within the CD34 positive compartment of cells, you normally have a spectrum of CD123 positive cells. Uh, looking at, um, at this further, you can also have CD123 high expressors uh, that are CD34 negative in the bone marrow. These include plasma cytodendritic cells as well as basophils most commonly, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner plot, uh, where we use HLADR to make a distinction between PDCs and basophils, because basophils are negative for HLADR but strong for 123, whereas PDCs are positive for both CD123 and HLADR. This plot is to is this this slide is to remind me to uh, to show you really that. Um, uh, CD123 expression is not unique, or I would say strong CD123 expression is not unique to BPDCN. Uh, on the right-hand panel, you see BPDCN again showing very strong CD123 expression along with HLA-DR by flow. And the bottom panel on the, on the left-hand side shows you this dual expression of CD123 in red as well as TCF4 in brown. And these uh, two markers, these two antigens, uh, when present within the same cell in a tumor, are, are very highly sensitive and specific for BPDCN. But again, if you pivot to the right-hand uh, plot, uh, you see CD123 expression as we commonly actually see it in acute myeloid leukemia at an intensity that is not very, uh, that is not too modest. It's not as strong as that in, of, of BPDCN, but CD123 in AML and in ALL uh, is, is usually there. It's clearly there in a, in a large subset of cases. At the bottom right, you see a case of systemic mastocytosis where the neoplastic mast cells are strongly positive for CD123 and of course, as you would expect, are negative for TCF4. A few words about TCF4 CD123 co-expression in BBDCN, which we mentioned uh, a short bit ago. Uh, so uh, dual expression in our uh, experience, and this is from a, a paper that we published uh, about a year ago. Uh, uh, Dr. Sukswai is from Thailand. He did an excellent job putting together this data set where we showed that TCF4 CD123 co-expression is really uh, sensitive in uh, up to 100% analytic sensitivity and uh, a, an analytic specificity of 99.8% for BPDCN. So if you have co-expression of these two markers, you're dealing with BPDCN. Importantly, if you don't have expression of these two markers in the same cells, you can be very certain you're not dealing with BPDCN. This is from our paper. Uh, I, I would focus your attention on that large central figure where you see CD123, which as we know is a membranous protein um, uh, being positive in a membranous slash cytoplasmic pattern. Uh, and TCF4, which is a transcription factor, and transcription factors, as you might know, reside in the nucleus almost by definition, if not exclusively. Uh, so TCF4 uh, sits in the nucleus and so gives us this nice brown signal in the nucleus. That's why we can visualize those two antigens in the same cells, because they do not overlap. Naveen, uh, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Um, we made a diagnosis of BPDCN on our patient. We determined that she is positive for all the markers that we want to see. She has no lineage markers to overlap with BPDCN. So she's negative for CD19, CD3, myeloproxidase uh, in her uh, tumor cells. And so what would you do as a next step? Wow, thank you, Joe. What a helpful 
and very topical uh, summary because now uh, we now know that Stacy has BPDCN. We've ruled out AML, and so now it's time to talk about therapy. What's exciting nowadays is that we've entered into the modern era of targeted therapy for BPDCN. And so before this time, Joe, uh, a lot of my colleagues from around the world had limited options. Most therapy regimens for BPDCN had been borrowed from acute leukemia and lymphoma uh, and other uh, programs, including AML-based, so standard seven and three induction, ALL-based, uh, our preferred is hyper -CVAD, but uh, other uh, regimens based on Asian comorbidities and even uh, the CHOP regimen uh, in lymphoma, which we've heard of, uh, all about earlier. You know, these multi-agent intensive chemotherapies generally can put the patient with BPDCN into remission about 50 to 60% of the time, but most of our patients were experiencing either a quick relapse or a death in one to one and a half years in the setting of the usual situations that we find our other AML and ALL patients, so infections, multi-organ failure, frank disease relapse. And so these therapy regimens were intense. They were suboptimal. The real-world patient with BPDCN is generally 70 years or older, comorbidities. And so we and others started to seek out some other new way to treat these patients. And so the, the real breakthrough was the finding of CD123 really expressed, overexpressed, as you just nicely showed, in 100%. All patients with BPDCN should and will have this overexpression. So IL-3 receptor alpha, as you showed, CD123. And historically, there had been no approved uh, therapies. You can see this cartoon nicely showing all of the active, these are active uh, programs that are out there. Diphtheria toxin with the Tigraxifus, which I'll show more data on, bispecific and dual targeting modalities, antibody drug conjugates, CAR T cells, you name it. There's a lot of different ways. Why? Because CD123 is a surface marker. It's a potentially attractive marker on the surface of BPDCN should be less expressed on the normal hematopoietic uh, stem cell, and uh, this should allow it to be targeted. So Joe, what happened was is in seeking out um, targeted agents, one that uh, came early on to our attention was that of the diphtheria toxin uh, to Graxifus. And so this drug is the only uh, FDA approved CD123 targeting agent, and it's the first targeted therapy approved uh, in BPDCN. It's a novel agent. It's a truncated diphtheria toxin payload. That's the platform. It's conjugated to a recombinant human IL-3, and then it's delivered as an IV drug. And, and, and the program here is to induce a protein synthesis death uh, in the cancer cells. And this drug did gain approval December 2018 for patients with BPDCN ages two and older. Uh, I was fortunate to be the leader of the trial that led to this approval as shown here. So this was a phase one, two trial of Tigraxifusp in patients with BPDCN, uh, adult patients, and it was a multi-center uh, study, monotherapy, which featured 32 patients in the frontline setting and 15 patients in the relapse refractory setting, all with BPDCN. And so as you can see on the left, patients, uh, which the total number is 47 here, were put through this study at varying doses of Tigraxifus. Of course, it started out as a traditional phase one, three plus three dose escalation at seven micrograms, all the way up to 12 micrograms per kilogram per day. The drug is IV. It's planned for up to five days, 21 day or three a week cycle. And then the repeated cycles uh, go on until uh, unacceptable toxicity or progression. Primary endpoints for this definitive pivotal study or complete remission, and a unique marker for the BPDCN field known as CRC, or a clinical complete remission, which allows for uh, residual skin uh, of unknown significance. Secondary endpoints, of course, overall response and safety and overall survival. So let's look at these data as shown here. We were able to publish these in New England Journal last year, April 2019. On the left is a swimmer plot, which allows us to look at uh, all of this data in aggregate. And really what you can see here is the vast majority of patients actually did have a major response, 90%, 90% of the frontline patients, so that's 29, who received the Tigraxifus or SL-401 agent at the 12 microgram uh, dosing. Many of those patients, 45%, actually proceeded uh, 
to a stem cell transplant, that's notable because these patients represented a real world group of patients age 60, 65 and over. On the right here, you can see the Kaplan-Meier for survival curve. Again, if the historical expectation for this field was eight to 14 months in most of the published studies, here, as you can see, survival rates at 18 and 24 months, so that's year and a half, two years at 59 and 52% respectively, really surprising us uh, with remarkable response rates, at least compared to a historical uh, population. So as we saw from our colleagues in the CD30 section just before, I think the visual uh, pictures are very helpful to see. Same thing here in BPDCN, the skin lesions can be disfiguring, debilitating in some patients. We really saw remarkable responses in the clinic after one to two cycles in, in many of the patients as shown here. Well, with any new uh, drug, Joe, we have to talk about new side effects and toxicities that may be uncovered. And it, with this drug, Tegraxafus, it's not a brand new toxicity, that of capillary leak syndrome, but it is associated with the drug. Uh, the more common adverse events are shown on the left here. Those are elevations in ALT, AST, so LFTs, low albumin by itself, and low platelets or thrombocytopenia. But the most serious and potentially fatal toxicity was that of the capillary leak syndrome in almost 20% of the patients. This does result in a systemic uh, syndrome, as you were mentioning earlier, and it's very important to note that this uh, garnered a black box warning on the drug. So I want all of the clinicians and everyone watching to be aware of this. It can lead to death, but it can also be managed and mitigated appropriately by following the albumin, the kidney function, liver function, and, and daily weights. I thought you brought up a really important point, and this is why I love this program, this clinical pathologic correlation that you're reminding us that CD123 is actually kind of ubiquitously overexpressed all throughout the body, including in healthy tissues, such as uh, endothelial cells. So I think that's an important point. Uh, also, this is a diphtheria conjugated uh, entity. And so there are other drugs such as Demlucan Diffitox, uh, which was used oh. in lymphoma, Moxitumumab, which is conjugated to uh, Pseudomonas toxin that can lead to the capillary leak syndrome. So I think it's very important that you reminded us of that. Well, so now we just finished the ASH meeting of 2020, and I was able to present an update on this drug, which is a new CD123 targeting agent, IMGN632. It's an antibody drug conjugate. It's a novel agent, uh, supposedly is designed because it has a higher affinity binding to the CD123 entity itself. And this novel payload known as DGN549 really leads to DNA alkylating activity. Uh, and there is also a new peptide linker. So this is a different agent than the Tegraxafus uh, that I just showed you. Uh, and this is being uh, investigated in patients with both AML and BPDCN. And so what I showed at ASH was that this drug, IMGN632, in specifically patients with relapsed refractory BPDCN, uh, again, this drug is given IV as well, uh, also on a three-week cycle. Uh, this drug showed an overall response rate of 29% which was in a very heavily pretreated population of patients, including a third of which approximately had Tegraxafus prior, so therefore representing sort of the first sequential CD123 therapy uh, report. Uh, but as you can see from the visuals here in this uh, particular program, which is ongoing, there were remarkable responses seen in the clinic by imaging, also by skin and bone marrow. Uh, this drug is only given once every three weeks, representing a potentially uh, convenient dosing schedule for many of these uh, patients with BPDCN. So very exciting field with multiple CD123 targeting agents being developed. Joe, you mentioned that CD123 is expressed in other entities outside of BPDCN. Very important, as you mentioned. So myelofibrosis, CMML, AML. And so this is one uh, study uh, as well that we presented at ASH with monotherapy with the Tegraxafus agent in myelofibrosis. Again, here, these are in patients who are relapsed refractory, so they should have failed one prior therapy, and stable disease was noted in a number of these patients, and several spleen and symptom burden responses were also noted. Importantly, in patients who had monocytosis, so those are the subsets that should overexpress the CD123, there were responses as well. And so this study is ongoing, uh, at collecting more data and, and enrolling more patients. Uh, again, another setting is CMML, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, where we have 
uh, a similar phase one, two trial going with the tigraxifusp agent. Same pr principle here. Again, monocytes overexpressing CD123, targeting uh, that niche area, seeing bone marrow responses in this ongoing study. Toxicity is, of course, important. Now, I will note that there's different dosing schedules and parameters in, in all of these tigraxifusp studies, but basically the same toxicity profile, hypoalbuminemia, thrombocytopenia, capillary leak syndrome, uh, to be monitored anytime this drug is being administered. And so that brings us to the patient again, where Stacy was confirmed by you and the team for BPDCN. We prepared her with sort of risk benefit, talking about capillary leak syndrome, signed consent for the new agent, tigraxifusp, uh, admitted to the hospital as we do for all patients in cycle one and induction. Ample pre-medications were given uh, and being aware of infusion-related reactions. And again, as I mentioned, the dosing is IV. 12 microgram per kilogram is the FDA-approved dose. It's only a 15-minute uh, infusion planned to be given over five days, over a 21-day cycle. But remember, watching out for the creatinine, albumin, daily weight, holding the drug if those parameters aren't met. And so the follow-up, Joe, is that our patient was able to receive uh, her tigraxifus therapy, and after two cycles was noted to have a major uh, objective response. And so as I turn it back to you, it really makes me reflect as I hear this program, think about our cases together. My goodness, in these rare diseases that we've dedicated our careers to, how important it is for a collaborative effort, not just an academic effort for research, but for diagnosing the patients in front of us and managing. In BPDCN alone, we're talking about dermatology, dermatopathology, hematopathology, stem cell transplant, hematology, oncology, the list goes on and on. And so I want to turn it back to you. What is your thought in thinking about how central the role is of the pathologist, both at diagnosis, later on at relapse? Joe, what, what are your thoughts on that? Naveen, thank you. Um, I, I really feel that uh, in this context, PPDCN is a remarkable example of how we have gone in the past just maybe 20 years or so from an entity that was not known before, that uh, an entity whose name we couldn't figure out for a while, to now deciphering a lot of the, the components of this type of cancer, having diagnostic tools, having therapeutic targets, and having tools now not only to make the baseline diagnosis and of course provide you with the with the with the uh, data to kind of know how to approach the patient of course but uh, also uh, we are going to the next level of having tools that allow us to evaluate the level of residual disease we don't really know what that means uh, in the context of BPDCN, but we were able to, uh, from a pathology perspective, in a way, close the loop uh, with the development of a of a uh, flow cytometry panel that we published recently in a paper uh, led by Wei Wang, uh, where we demonstrate that using that panel and our understanding of BPDCN immunophenotype and the expression of CD123 and other markers in normal hematopoietic stem cells uh, achieve a sensitivity of one cell in 10,000 or 0.01%, which is equivalent to what we achieve in AML. And uh, and kind of, you know, this brings us uh, again uh, in, in full circle uh, in terms of tools. And so what I think our uh, homework, our task is over the coming years is refining, using those tools, of course, to, to refine the approach, expand uh, the, the range of CD123 targeted therapies, of course, all the things that you are a leader on uh, in that regard. Yeah, and, and Joe, I wanted to mention, I would be remiss if I didn't build on your very important points. Uh, a couple of things to add. One is, as you brought up, this concept of MRD, minimal residual disease, or now our colleagues calling measurable uh, residual disease, very important that you and your team are leading uh, 
just for our clinicians out there, as you and I have discussed many times, we don't exactly know what that definition is yet in BPDCN as we do in multiple myeloma in ALL, AML, but uh, we are working on that. So I think this is very important for future directions. Number two, I didn't mention for our patients, 66 years old, very fit. Part of the goal, as I showed you in the Tegraxa Plus and the New England Journal experience has to be that of stem cell transplant in the fit patient who we can send the patient to, allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, I think then the concept there is post-stem cell transplant monitoring, right? So MRD, watching for relapse, again, as you're mentioning. And then finally, this concept of alternating therapy, which has been brought up in ALL, uh, multiple myeloma, and others. So not just using a monotherapy, but can we go for cure, maybe even obviating the need for stem cell transplant with, with novel targeted agents. So I think that's where your nice comments lead my mind to think of for the future of, of our rare disease. So uh, that's just fantastic. I think at this point, Joe, what I want to do is turn it over to Steve. I think we can go to that last slide. Let's see if we've got any questions coming in, Steve, from the audience here. Oh, wow. Yeah, and actually, I had a couple questions, too, if I can ask you, Naveen, in, in thinking about transplant as consolidation and potentially curative therapy, is there minimum criteria or, or how not good of a remission does, can someone be in and still have a successful transplant? And then I think the other thing for patients that may have to then move to a specialized center, what's the timing? How, how much time do you have after disease control is attained to get that person to transplant if the goal is, is curative intent? Well, what I've learned and what we've published on is kind of, I would say, three bedrock principles so far. So one is, for sure, I recommend and I really do practice allo stem cell transplant and CR1, if at all possible, for the fit, you know, select patient. So it should be a complete remission. Of course, anecdotally, as you might imagine, and why this is a brilliant question you asked, yes, I have sent several patients of mine to transplant with just a PR, partial response. And there are varying situations, Steve. So maybe someone with massive bone marrow disease, 98% blast, uh, minimal skin lesions, and massive lymphadenopathy. Perhaps I've vanquished the lymph node disease in the bone marrow, but maybe there's some residual skin disease. I've had some success sending patients. But for ease and convenience, let's say complete remission of all the compartments, go to transplant and first remission. I have had success, number two, with transplanting patients with our team here, Dr. Kozelbosch, my colleague in CR2, although that's the rare patient to do. And then number three, there is the auto stem cell transplant. I on purpose didn't bring that up in my slides, but there have been some reports. We've, we've done it as well in, in the New England Journal experience. We did publish on three patients. That's still unclear, Steve, who should go for transplant from an autologous source in BPDCN. Could it be skin only uh, patients? Could it be the older unfit patients? So that's a big question mark. But but that's basically what I would say. I still do recommend if you can get to an academic center to do that. But as you and others have noted, you know, with the drug being commercially available now for exactly two years as of this taping, um, I do think that we need to start understanding how the drug is delivered in the community setting, how people are going to transplant. I think still the timing should be in, in first remission, Steve. And and just in a sense of that window, once remission is, ach is achieved, in your experience, because I think you have the most experience, these remissions are very short or fragile, or you have a little bit of time to get things organized? Well, you know, with Tegraxafus, and I'm hoping this is going to be the case with all the CD123 drugs, we were able to have time. We definitely had patients who were older, unfit for intensive chemotherapy, if you will, who were able to see very durable uh, responses. So that's demonstrated in two ways. One is that only 45% of the patients were able to go to transplant. So some of these patients uh, were able to have durable responses without. And two, you're right, as you know, as you well know, you and I do, a transplant doesn't happen automatically. That's right. You have to have everything lined up. So we are seeing durable responses with CD123 targeted uh, therapy. And that's a very exciting development. And yeah. patient's hair isn't falling out. You're not seeing as many neutropenic fevers, I think, as we thought. So I think this may be a very nice approach, particularly for uh, some of these older patients out there. Thank you. Uh, and maybe here for Joe, uh, what is the most common error you see leading to misdiagnosis of uh, BPDCN, mistaking it for AML? And what suggestions do you have for community practices where we see few myeloid cancers over the course of a year? 
And I guess maybe take that from the perspective of the pathologist receiving a bone marrow, but maybe also advice for clinicians communicating to their pathologist to, to sort of maximize the chance of getting to a good result. Yeah, that's a great question, Steve. Um, you know, I've, I've long advocated for uh, making sure that CD123 is included in uh, every lab, uh, uh, every lab's acute panel or acute leukemia panel. As you might know, a lot of patients come through and they don't have a prior diagnosis. And so labs that do flow cytometry typically, uh, uh, you know, select a set of markers. There's no standard, uh, but typically select a set of markers that uh, give them the, the maximum uh, ability to detect different types of leukemias. Now, until uh, recently, as far as I know, uh, most leukemia screening panels, to my knowledge, have not included CD123. And my opinion, without CD123 being part of the panel, particularly at large reference labs or any lab that, that services a, a pretty, uh, that, that has a, a high volume of testing, Without CD123 being there, it is very easy to miss BPDCN. I think of all the patients who are often or sometimes labeled refractory or primary refractory AML, uh, those patients could be a pool that is enriched for BPDCN patients, uh, for, for BPDCN, uh, because distinguishing AML from BPDCN rests first and foremost on detecting high CD123 expression. If one relies only on CD4 and CD56, that's not going to be enough. Uh, other other um, challenging areas in that field include um, benign plasma, plasma cytodendritic cell proliferations that sometimes occur in patients who have CMML or MDS. Uh, these are benign lower grade, uh, these are lower grade proliferations. I should not call them benign because data is out there now to indicate that they are clonal in nature. Uh, but those can sometimes uh, be misleading and can fool one into thinking they're dealing with BPDCN when they're really dealing with a more benign version uh, of, uh, albeit neoplastic, of, of PDC proliferation. And last but not least is uh, uh, now that we have more of the tools at our disposal, as we mentioned earlier, to make a distinction between AML and BPDCN at, at, uh, at certain institutions, we are seeing, uh, and data is coming out in, in press, uh, an overlap between AML and BPDCN on occasion, where you see AML expressing plasma cytoid dendritic cell immunophenotype, where you see, uh, as we saw not too long ago at our institution, a case of uh, really a hybrid, almost like a mixed phenotype acute leukemia, where it was AML and BPDCN almost in the same population. It was a very unusual case, uh, that one. And without the tools that we have now, we could have never have seen, been able to see that, that level of nuance. So, so I hope that captures, I think first and foremost, because as Naveen elegantly mentioned earlier, the treatment of AML is so vastly different from that of BPDCN, uh, it is very important to make, uh, to, to kind of tease out BPDCN from the AML pool. Great, thank you. Um, another question, Naveen, you touched on this a little bit, but, um, what are your approaches to mitigating or managing uh, capillary leak syndrome with tegrastifos? And then maybe also some comments in terms of first cycle, people without experience. Is this, is this something that can be done first time or is it a learning curve? And, you know, what's your advice for people um, new to this disease? Right, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the short answer is learning curve for sure. Um, yeah, I think my practice points, luckily, I, I've been telling people this around the world, which is really lovely to say, actually everything we put in the paper and in the package label is literally everything I do. But the problem with that is that's a lot of stuff, right? You have to read and, and know about all that. So I would say a couple of principles. One, I think that 
you absolutely have to admit patients to the hospital for the first cycle. We did that on all the patients on the study. I still do that in the commercial setting, so that's part of it. Number two, for the capillary leak syndrome, this is actually, now that I've researched this, this could be a whole other uh, segment, right, which is this is common in the targeted therapy area. I mentioned a couple of these agents, right? Denlook and Diffitox, Moxitumumab. These are, these are all drugs that are toxin conjugated targeted agents. I think you have to go with education with yourself, your staff, the patient in great detail. Hey, this can be a potentially life-threatening toxicity. Let's watch out for it. Number two, man, I have never looked at albumin so much in my life until I started doing BPDCN and, and working with this agent. So checking the albumin nights, holidays, weekends, every day, replacing albumin in the right situations, keeping the weight dry. So this is something important. When you get in the hospital, the first thing they put an IV on you, they start giving you fluids, keep people on the dry side, watch the creatinine. And then finally, the mitigation of the capillary leak syndrome. There's no uniform way to do this, but in general, I found that administration, Steve, of steroids, diuresis, early transfer to ICU, vasopressors if it's needed, et cetera, et cetera, right, based on the clinical situation, that you can still not only mitigate and prevent the CLS, but you can actually treat and reverse people back from it uh, if it develops. So I think I would definitely recommend for those centers who it's their first time to really reach out to me or, or one of the other experts out there. Uh, the company itself has uh, this um, patient assistance program, which has been very generous and helpful uh, in the commercial setting. So they can deploy someone to send out to, to, to help people with the first time administration. And then really involving the PharmD. Steve, we didn't mention that yet in this program. I think our pharmacists at Sloan and MD Anderson are, are just phenomenal. They give you a lot of tidbits and advice before, during, and after the therapy. So try to engage your pharmacy team along with your pathology team uh, in the management of these patients. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.